Hello. Nice to see you again. Great to have you all here already. And we are going to wait for a couple more minutes until everyone has had a chance to arrive. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. 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 Hi, Luis. Nice to see you. <laughs> hey, hey. Hey, nice to see you. Nice from Berlin? You. Yeah, from Berlin, from Berlin. <laughs> nice. Nice. Hi, Yankush. Hi, Danny. <clears throat> Hi, Manu. Hi, Pablo. Nice to see you. Okay, David, you want to, to start introducing the session? Yeah. This is the second Argela Community Meetup. Nice to have all of you here. And the last time how we structured the meeting was that we gave a brief introduction about generally deploying Argela and how to get a data set up and running. And this time, Daddy will do the same by showcasing how you might use Argela in combination with the Argela trainer to train a spacing model. During that time, you can actually ask questions through Q&A so that we can uh, have these structured, but also feel free to just post random questions about things that you might want to discuss. Danny just shared a collab that you might use to join with the programming. And after that, I will just walk you through how we normally go about doing PRs and, and finding good relevant issues to also show and share how we think about these kind of things. On top of that, this session is being recorded. So also, if you feel uncomfortable, feel free to turn off your camera or microphone and these kind of things. And if there are any questions, then feel free to ask them. And then I'll give the stage to Danny to get started. Nice. I hope you see the collab. Yep. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I guess like from the people I see in the call, you already know Argila more or less, but anyway, I wanted to start with some thoughts and some a description of what what's Argila and how we think about the, the space of uh, NLP and, and LLMs. So yeah, why we are building Argila is because we think that in order to build good AI solutions, and by that I mean safe, accurate, and cost efficient, we need to enable teamwork. Uh, and the teamwork with good be should be distributed about different roles and backgrounds. So not only the AI team or the data team, but other type of profiles should actually contribute to, to making these systems better. Uh, and we think that the key to effective, impactful teamwork in AI, uh, probably the best way to do that is to collaborate on the data that we use to train and to evaluate these systems. So based on that, it's an open source platform to build language models, both large and small. And the idea is that these profiles can collaborate together with machines, so models, in order to actually have the best data to make sure that these systems are working and to actually know how to improve them over time. So we are building Argila for AI, ML, NLP, data engineers, data scientists, computational linguists. So all these profiles that work on the data side of things or the model side of things, but also highly important for us is the subject matter experts, the domain experts, and any type of business profile or people working on safety uh, for making sure that these systems uh, work. And what people want to do with Argila, or we hope they want to do with Argila is to fine tune, evaluate and maintain over time. And this idea of maintaining over time, these systems is key to, to Argila. Uh, and they want to do this for both small cost efficient models, predictive NLP models, but also for solutions based on LLMs or large language models. And how we Enable this is with two core components. One is the library, so a Python library that is built on this idea of continuous and iterative uh, human in the loop workflows. And the UI that is designed not for the typical crowd worker labeling data, but for more, as I said, for subject matter experts that at the same time explore the data and label the data or provide feedback. So those are the two key components. And with that, I will go and do a quick start demo. So for those of you that know the tool already, 
uh, I wanted to add some new things for you to discover. So it's not the typical boring quick start, uh, but you hopefully learn something along the way. So the first part I will show is how, how to actually deploy a private Argila space based on some discussions with the team, with Alvaro specifically this, this week. We found out that it is actually possible to have a private Argila space on the Hugging Face app. And I will show how to do it and how to connect to it. That's the first part. And then for the second part, I, I will show you how to use the new task templates to very quickly create a text classification data set. And then we will do some labeling and fine tuning a small model. Are there any questions so far or comments? Okay. So the first thing we need to do is to install the Argila. Yeah. So the first part is about installing the packages that we need. So Argila, data sets, and setfit, because we are going to use a setfit for training, uh, for fine tuning a model. So we will install them with pip. Then we actually need our hug and paste token that you can find it here. And the reason for that is that we actually need to pass this to connect to the private space. So I don't know if you have used before the integration we have with having face spaces, but typically we recommend to have a public space, but we got many users asking for actually having this private. So any, so only them can actually access this, this space. I will show you what I mean by that. Yeah. Once we set the token, we actually connect to the Argila server. And we say every API call that we do to the server, we will add the happy face token. So in order to connect to your private space, you only need to add this, uh, and you will be connecting to this uh, private space. I will show you in a second. So if I go to my profile, I created this private space that only myself can see. So I don't know if I can show you, but uh, yeah, because I'm not sharing the full screen, but now one second. In the meantime, if there are questions. So when creating a private space with, with Argila Docker image, there's nine uh, environment variables, but we don't need to fill them. Sorry, again? Um, I'm, I'm following along. I'm creating a private space as well. And with the Argila Docker integration, it was telling me nine, there's nine environment variables. And I don't mm -hmm. need to fill them. I don't need to fill them. If you don't want to, no. If you don't want to, no, because that's if you don't fill them, you will have the defaults. So if it's private, uh, no one will see the, the space. So you really don't need to change that. But if you want, you can. OK, perfect. Thank you. So now I guess you see my full screen. So if I go to this and paste this space, I will get a 404, so this space is private. So if I'm not logging, no one can see it. So essentially that means that no one outside uh, of my uh, account will, will see the space, but I still can do uh, labeling and connect to, to this space. So the way I created this, you see, is like that. So new space, then private two, then Docker, then Argila, and then here you can change this, but it's not needed. Uh, and then the space secrets is what we said, like I can change this if, if I want, but the, otherwise we will use the defaults. And typically we recommend it to set it public. Uh, so everyone going to your profile or your organization profile could actually see this, this space. But now in this case, we are going to keep it private. And that's all we need. So in order to don't take too long, let's go back to this the space. So the first time you come here, you need to put the, the default credentials. So now in this private uh, workspace uh, is what we are going to use for the, for the rest of the, of the tutorial. So essentially if we run this, I created a really silly data set containing instructions for a language model, like synthetically generated. And we can see maybe like this, we can see a bit better. Uh, so 
what I will do is to use this pandas data frame to create a data set in Alvina. And this part is uh, also about discovering this new feature that is called task templates. And the idea of these task templates is to help you quickly set up a kind of well-known or standard data sets. So for example, text classification, summarization, and then more LLM related, like supervised fine tuning. But in this case, to keep it simple, we will use it to, to set up uh, a text classification data set. So every, the only thing you need to do is to use the uh, feedback data set for, and then you can discover the type of data sets we offer. But in this case, we are going to create a very silly data set with two labels. So it will be a binary text classification data set, no multi-label or anything, just that. And this will create an instance of the data set that looks like this. So it has uh, one field that is text, and then it has some questions. This is how we call the feedback part in Argila feedback. So in this case, we have created a, just a field called label with a description, a title, and so on. And then we will see how this looks in the UI. And it automatically creates a, guide, a guideline as well that you can uh, modify later in the UI. So this will be the annotation guidelines. So now that we have a dataset instance, we can add some uh, records. So in this case, what I'm doing is to look through the text in the data frame and then just creating instances of records. And if we see this, for example, the first record is essentially the first text in the pandas data frame. Okay, now we have the records and we just need to push this data into our data. So we add the records to the local instance of the data set, and then we just publish this on the instance, and the instance is defined by this init method. So with this, hopefully, we will see the data set here. OK, so this is the very simple and silly data set. If we go to the settings, we can see that we have some configurations that we can do, for example, changing the name of the, the title of the text field, changing the information of the question. So for example, if you want to add more context to your uh, labelers to understand what this question is about or add some context, and you can even modify the guidelines. So here we could say like introduction, and then you can use markdown here. So this will be seen by your annotators while, while they annotate. For example, you can say labels. I have nonsense and of good. OK, anything you can imagine there. <clears throat> if we go back to the data set, so as I said, like this task is really simple. So the, the idea is that we will be reading some text, which is an instruction for, for a language model or assistant. And we will judge if it's a good question or actually it's a nonsense question. So nonsense can be something that the LLM can give a creative or made up answer, uh, but not something that is a, a question that the LLM can answer. So in this case, this is probably a good question. How can I sell a bridge in Brooklyn? This is nonsense. Explain the process of photosynthesis is good. Where can I find is good? How am I, uh, so this is good. When is the best time? This is good. Okay, so yeah, you get the idea. So for example, persuade the concept of a square circle. This could be like kind of a creative answer. So let's put that to nonsense. Here you can see the progress. So I just labeled like a few examples in the other data set that I created before. I have some more examples and I can review the work that I did. For example, this is a nonsense instruction. This is a nonsense instruction because we are trying to ask to recommend the process of photosynthesis. Okay, so the idea is that I have now labeled some data 
and I can come back to my column and I will show you how to use the Agila trainer module that provides integration with different frameworks. In this case, we are doing a text classification task. So we have integrations with Transformers, Spacey, and Setfit. And I will show you how to actually use the data set with just label with this module. So in this case, I'm importing the trainer and the training task. That is the class that defines the fields and the questions that will be used for training the model. And I'm reading the data set from Argila. So if when I created this data set, I could have done like something like remote data set. And then I would get an instance of a remote data set and I wouldn't need to fetch it. But typically the training process happens uh, not at the same time you create the data set. So you push the data set, you do some labeling and maybe some days after you want to do the, the training. So that's why I show here how to actually retrieve the, the data. So then the other thing we need to do is to define the task. In this case, it's a training task or text classification. I have a text field and a label. And then here I have the Argila trainer. And the interesting part is that I can use different frameworks. So for example, I'm using Setfit, but I could use Spacey or Transformers. But in this case, we are going to use Setfit. This will create an instance of the trainer and some information about the setup. You can update the settings, but in this example, I'm not showing that. You can find that in the, in the docs. And then the next step is just to call train and tell where to actually put the training results. <clears throat> yeah, this will take some minutes. <clears throat> Any questions? Danny, let's say we want to put some default labels already. If there is like one class is heavy in the data set, is there a way for us to do so like in the records, like to show pre-field pre responses? Let's say in a good or nonsense or data set, let's say mm -hmm. most of the questions are good. So if we want to put a default already. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. You can, you can do that. Uh, and for doing that, you need to use something called uh, suggestions. Maybe I can show you. Okay. So. Imagine we have this record, oh, no records, sorry. So in this case, uh, I don't know, do you see well? Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. Clearly. Okay. Yeah. So re records, actually they have a field called suggestions. And the way they work is that when you create the records, for example, here, when I was creating the records, I was just adding the fields. I could add this as well. But I don't remember the syntax very well, but suggestions, I guess. I shared the docs as well. So you can also okay. copy paste from there. Okay. Yeah, so we can say, thanks, David. Oh, so question name in our case is label. And then, as you said, maybe we can, we want to pre-fill like everything with good. Uh, let me, okay. So now the record contains a suggestion and we can create. Okay. So in this case, did I push it or not? Pushing records. I don't know why it's not having anything. Me neither. Oh, but maybe you did add records, which adds them to the current data set. Okay. Yeah. To the, okay. Let's do this again. So now we have the suggestions and then, so now if we go here, we see that we have this suggestion. So yeah, this is indicated by this. So what I can do is just to kind of validate everything and then if i need to change something i change it but i can go much faster to actually validate it and this is probably a silly example because we put always the same default but the idea of the suggestion is that if you have a few shot model or a zero shot model you can generate the suggestion 
So when you are annotating data, you see directly a suggestion and you just need to change it or validate it. So it's a very good question. Are there any also more something. questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and this is also something that, could, that you can add programmatically whenever you have your uh, model running inference so that you would gather new data while doing this. Exactly. Okay, so now we have the model trained and we can just use the model uh, to You're just... not sharing your screen anymore. Yeah, Danny. again, sorry. Now? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we trained this very simple model and we can now use it. So I don't know what is probably is very bad, but yeah. Okay, so we see that there is not, the confidence is not so high, but uh, we actually train with uh, very few uh, examples and probably this is a, a difficult task as well. <clears throat> so then if we wanted to actually use another framework, we just need to set up another trainer. So we don't need to define the task anymore. We already said, this is my uh, task with a text and, and a, a text field and a, and a label. And we can just run this and behind the scenes, it will actually, I promise this uh, worked before. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think we will not spend more time trying to fix this. I don't know David, if you want to go ahead or there are questions. Yeah, also feel free to, to ask questions about like general other topics uh, regarding Angela, NLP or these kind of things throughout like the entire session because we can also hand, handle those uh, in between. Uh, otherwise, I will just continue with uh, uh, giving a presentation of how we normally look at GitHub issues, how we deal with them, how you might find interesting issues and actually pick up a, a pull request or these kind of things. Okay, then I'll continue with that. So, Let's see, share my entire screen. So normally when, what we do is when yeah, working with the yeah, repository, uh, what we always recommend people is to take a look at the repository, join us on, on Slack, LinkedIn, and these kind of things, which you have already done quite nicely. Then whenever yeah, you explore like a new repository for any project, so not only for Agila, what we also recommend is looking at the documentation in general within the readme or looking at the documentation specifically for contributors. And what you can see is here is for us, but it's also the case for all other frameworks out there, uh, Hugging Face or DeepSet or these kind of things, is that we often have these contributor and developer docs where the developer docs are really about like developing. So really deploying everything that you might need for installing the dependencies and these kind of things. And the contributor docs is yeah, focused on, on contributing and how that uh, goes. So that's what I want to present today is step by step, go about how to find good issues. For you guys, what you can do is go yeah, to this URL to showcase that. Then normally within the contributors docs, we yeah, recommend, as mentioned, uh, contacting us over Slack. And what happens is that when you yeah, find an issue or find something that you might want to start working on or something that isn't directly integrated within Argela or is missing in your opinion, then you can actually create a appropriate issue on GitHub. So normally what we recommend is searching if an issue already exists. And otherwise what we recommend is opening appropriate issue, book report, documentation report, or a feature request whenever there's something new uh, that you might to want to add. Then after that, what happens is that you actually want to create a fork of the repository. And this fork of the repository allows you to make changes to a copy of the repository, which we can later on, once again, merge within the main repository that everyone can install. So the entire community of Agila and everyone worldwide. We normally also yeah, recommend just copying the forking the, the developer branch and then working from there, because otherwise you have all these other feature branches that you might not need in your development process. Then actually creating a new branch or creating a new branch so that you can later on merge that and making the changes, creating a pull request, then we will review the pull request. And after that, yeah, the PR is merged and we'll actually release that in the next uh, version of Argilla. So I think some of you have already done this, but for the rest of us, we will walk you through how, what it, this might look like. So I've already created a fork of the repository. So if we would go to Argilla, 
and then my overview of my private account, then what happens is that we will actually see that there's this forked version of Argela. So normally what you would do is go to this forked version, then clone the, the forked version and actually clone that within an environment that you use for development. And that's what we, what I already did. Then what is next is actually going to the developer documentation because the developer documentation holds like all of the things that you might need for installing. So within our Jilla, that's actually cloning the environment, then installing everything via Conda. So ensuring that you have a local installation of the development uh, settings from your, for, for developing uh, your PR. Then you also want to install these code formatting tools to ensure that you adhere to the GitHub code form to the code format, code formatting that we actually apply. After that for Argilla, one of the things that we do is we log everything, all of our information in a vector database and a relational database. So these things are also needed to be set up. And on top of that, you either want to deploy a front end in order to ensure that the front end is functioning and you can actually play around with the UI as well, if you want to make UI updates and otherwise we recommend just setting up the server. In case of finding a good issue, what I've done is whoops, for Argela, I created this issue an hour ago to showcase how we go to an issue. And normally what we do is add these tags, good first issue or help wanted whenever there's issues that we feel that the community might be able to pick up by themselves. And one of the issues that I've actually created, let's say two hours ago was directly spotted by this community member. So it's also a good uh, exercise. And normally what you can do is just reach out, ask if, we, if you can pick up the issue and then eventually uh, make a PR. And then yeah, normally we will respond to that and actually work on this, this issue to review it. But for now, I will actually show you how, yeah, I would go about working on this issue. So we have our Argela yeah, clone and we have installed Anaconda and these kind of things. For the changes that we'll make in this case is that we'll add these representation methods to the feedback data set and the remote feedback data set. Because recently we've added these uh, metadata properties to the feedback data set and the remote feedback data set, but we forgot to update the representation methods for each one of these classes. So within the representation methods, what we actually normally show is an overview of everything that this data set contains, but we yeah, forgot to do this within all of the other changes. And that's what we will be working on or working through during this example. So what we need to do is actually launch Elasticsearch because we want to be able to test locally and you can follow this guideline for this. But basically you, we have a Docker image that we want to start. That's actually running Elasticsearch in the background in order to connect via to that via Argela. Next, we set up our database, which I've already done by make my making migrations, creating a default user. And then after that, we will run a local fast API server, which is the uh, Argela server that actually handles all of the logic whenever you connect to it via the Python SDK. And the Agila server makes updates to the Elastic Search database and also to the relational database for user management and these kind of things. First, I need to close my environment, and then I should be able to start my Agila server. And we actually need to do this because we also let's see because we also want to be able to ensure that all of the changes that we make locally to the server also are represented yeah, directly within our updates. So we don't want to use a pre-built Docker image because it might be that when we're developing that we're also making changes to the Agila fast API server that handles all of these logic. So what we can do is go to this example where yeah, I initialize Agila with a local connection so I don't need to fill out the URL on the API key because we are connecting to this local fast API server. And I'll run this example to showcase what we're showing now. And what we can see here is the current representation. So the print method of both the feedback data set 
and the remote feedback data set. And as you can see, there is no mention of these uh, metadata properties. So whenever we go into, for example, this definition of the feedback data set, what we can see is whenever we have this representation method, that there's no metadata properties added here. So what we might do is, or what I guess Copilot will probably come up with is that we want to add this metadata properties. So this is a thing that yeah we missed initially and we can add here. So this is one of the changes that we've done. Then we will go to the other definition, which is the feedback data set. And normally what we have is a remote feedback data set as well, where we can also go to their representation method. In this sense, we have once again, a lot of information, but uh, information about uh, metadata properties is missing. So in this case, we would also need to change that here. Uh, after having done these changes, what we also want to do is actually test whether these representation methods are implemented properly. And what we can do for that is run our like PyTest for both the local and the remote feedback data set. So initially what I can do is test whether the PyTest unit tests for the client feedback data set local have, uh, are all running. So if we go to test unit test client feedback data set local and test data set, we can actually see one of these uh, tests implemented here. And we expect that all of the tests are running to ensure that we don't have any backwards compatibility issues and that all of the, our updates don't break any other things. So whenever I run these tests currently, uh, we can actually see that they are failing. And that is the because I updated the representation method. So one thing that I would need to do in order to ensure that the tests are passing is actually up these, update these tests, where, for example, you would update this to also showcase the representation method. And in this case, what we've done is we have create a basic data set and then check if it, the output of the data set is actually printed correctly. And then when running the test again, we would expect that all of the tests pass, but let's see. There's a small mistake. And then we would expect all of the tests to pass. And then after doing these updates, what you will do is uh, yeah, update all of the relevant files. In this case, it's the data set file that we've updated, the other data sets file that we've updated here to add the metadata properties. Additionally, we have defined a test for the Let's see, uh, remote feedback data set uh, for the local feedback data set. And what I've also already done is define that test for the remote feedback data set as well, where we also would need to add the text. Dot indent F slash N and that data. Then we can actually add these kind of things to our updates. And then we actually know that they will be updated to our branch. Additionally, what we also want to do is actually make a reference in the change log. So these change logs represent all of the changes that we've done based on either additions, change, deprecated features, removed features, fixed features, or security vulnerabilities. And in this case, we have added something. So within the unreleased overview, what we normally do is create a reference to what we've added and update to the Thunder wrapper Thunder for the feedback data set and in remote feedback data set. And we would reference the pull request, but we'll do that later. So for now, we'll just keep it like that. And we can actually create this first overview of the change log where we might say feed, edit, representation, edit to the data sets. And we can actually push these changes to my fork of Argela. Then whenever you go to the GitHub overview of Argela, what you can do is create a pull request. 
then create a new pull request, compare across forks because we are we're working in a forked repository, and then select like my fork repository, which is David Berenstein, nineteen fifty seven Agila, and then do this pull request. And in this case, you can initially create a draft pull request where yeah we know that it's not done yet because it's uh, under development, but we can already provide some uh, reviews here. So what we might want to do here is, for example, say, hey, this pull request is, is from an old PR. Could you update it? And what happens is that you iterate over the entire process from building this uh, initial update for the representation method here and here to actually working towards a completely functional yeah, PR that's also adhering to the code standards and also adhering to all of the other things that we might want to integrate. Because what we normally notice is that everyone within the team has different opinions about everything. And similarly for everyone within the community that might want to contribute to these kind of things. So there's a lot of uh, yeah different opinions involved. And what we try to do is normally is overlap as much as possible and then work towards this initial PR or contribution. And yeah, that's always an entire process before actually uh, ending up with a good PR. But that's also something good to, to keep in mind. So don't feel motivated whenever you are working on these kind of things. Are there any questions? Hey, David, I had a, a question more regarding the first part, maybe. And I don't know if there's, can you hear no, me? I'm sorry. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I don't know if have time for it, but like, data was working on some kind of problem of uh, uh, extractive question answering. The goal was to try to extract kind of entities which are not usually in their data sets. So more domain specific ones like products that was interested in like possible ways to evaluate models because sometimes they are missing things. Sometimes they are also hallucinating or uh, jumping to conclusions. And I don't know if you have some tools to evaluate uh, tasks like and, that. And, mm -hmm. They are extractive question and answering in the form that they, the answer is in the uh, exactly phrased in the context or extractive in the form as LLMs extractive answering. So we are using like LLMs for it. Uh, mm -hmm. I started just checking the options that I had with some NER tools. Uh, but then I, I had to use some LLMs. I, I've seen that there are some LLMs also trained exactly for extractive tasks, like some universal nerd that is looking nice, but um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. The problem is that sometimes yes, models, they are not, another nice thing to evaluate is also if they're really extracting the, the things or sometimes adding text or jumping to conclusions, let's say. Yeah, so what we normally try to do is have these initial data sets with, for example, LLM suggestions, and then eventually try to, whenever applicable, fine tune a model to actually evaluate these more predictive tasks with smaller models or to evaluate to, to actually train a smaller model for doing that. In terms of LLMs, I'm not sure if you've used like Lama index or Langchain or these kind of things to, to set up your pipeline now. Mm -hmm. At the moment, because I, I think for uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, continue. Sorry. So for some of these solutions, I believe there's also validators that you can set in place. And if you want to have like extractive question and answering, you might be able to validate the initial outputs of the model afterwards to ensure that the exact phrase is directly in the text, so to say. And what you can do is also do a self reflex for self, what's it called? Self judgment for the model. So for example, given that you get an output from the model, prompt the model again and denote what the mistake is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. For the, yeah, for the metrics and these kind of things, there's a good example on question and answering or extractive question and answering within the Hugging Face NLP courses. And they really go through the, the process in depth. And that's also a thing that I might recommend for this. 
And then I think what we what you might be able to do is initially bootstrap your projects with LLM suggestions, predictions, and then later on when you have a data set available that actually adheres to the format that they mentioned in the Hugging Face uh, course, you would be able to fine tune a specific model, which allows you to have this super fine tuned, tailored, smaller, more efficient model while initially having bootstrapped your project with LLMs because you don't really want to annotate all of, all of the data manually. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yes, like partially, yes. I'll try to do uh, what, what is missing? I, I was wondering also if there is an option just to use also, uh, for example, you just showed the classification task with Argila mm -hmm. before. Do you have also some functionalities for, uh, for example, NER uh, tasks? Uh, to... Yeah. Yeah, we do. So one of the things that yeah we also discussed during the last community meetup is that we are working from going from our older data sets, the token text classification data set, the token classification set data set, and the text data set to our feedback data set. So one of the things that's currently still missing in the feedback data set is uh, token support, which we will which we are planning on adding this semester, so to say, before the end of uh, this year. We do still have support for the old token classification data set. So in that sense, you would be able to work with, with token classifications. But mm -hmm. in, in that sense, it's not really question answering because you're not yeah. allowed to able to combine these kind of things. What we do have is also a task template that's specifically tailored for how you might use RGLI in combination with a question, extractive question answering task. And that's actually within the task template overview. I will share my screen to also show this. So in that sense, what we what you would be able to do is actually initialize rt.feedback data set mm -hmm. for question answering. You might want to use markdown for this. You might want yeah, to define guidelines and metadata properties. Mm -hmm. But basically what you might be able to do is have this uh, text field with question, then another text field with the context. And then a uh, text question where people are allowed to provide the answer to the, the uh, question from outside of the context. It is like not a exact thing because if people yeah, write, yeah. start writing their own answers, then it doesn't align. But it's still a way to gather data within Argela for this task. And additionally, what we also have is this uh, fine-tune LLM integration for the task of question answering. And then what you would do is go to this task where you expect the data to, to be just like this. So a question, the context, and then the exact answer from the, the context. And okay. what you would then be able to do is do a similar approach where you define a, a training task for question answering, define the question for the field, define the context for the field, and then the answer that, that has been provided. Internally, I believe there's a warning that actually warns whether when their context doesn't fully, when the answer doesn't fully align with the context, so to say, because yeah, yeah that's the a requirement for uh, extractive question answering, and we do plan on supporting span labeling and these kind of things in the coming coming months. But that's also a thing that you can actually see within the, our roadmap, and also yeah, encouraged to actually provide feedback there. So one of the things that we are currently working on is sim similarity search, which will be released in the next release, filtering and sorting for suggestions and responses, bulk annotations, so being able to label a lot of records at the same time, and then eventually token classification, which will also include the span labeling, which might be relevant for the question answering. And that should yeah. be wrapped up in Q4. Okay, nice. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and feel free to also to reach out in Slack if, if you need help setting this up. And uh, we, we are eager to help. For sure. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, one about Hacktoberfest. We were a bit late with Hacktoberfest. So what we, what we were actually working on was reviewing the de developer documentation and contributor documentation. And one of, I think at the end of the month, we realized that Hacktoberfest was there. But we actually published at the end of the month some issues and they were tackled yeah, quite well, I think three or four of them. So I would say given that we were so late, the experience was really good. 
And last year I participated myself also in the Hacktoberfest to, yeah, to solve some issues. And it's a nice, nice excuse to actually start developing and contributing to open source. And does that answer your question, Louis? Or do you have any things to, to share about that? Yeah, yeah no, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Then maybe if there are no more questions, then I would like to thank you for coming. I believe after the session, you will also be receiving a feedback uh, email to, to either request for things that we can discuss during following uh, community meetups and also to be able to, yeah, maybe desubscribe or resubscribe for the following sessions. I'm not sure if Danny has something to share. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for, for participating. And I wanted to say, if you want to use these community meetups also to to go on stage and present something interesting in the domain of LLM, uh, that's perfectly fine. And it doesn't have to be directly using Argila. It can be something cool that you found out. So feel free to reach out and, and we will make that, that happen. Cool. Hope to see you next time again. Yeah. So yeah, this is a bi-weekly event, uh, bi by monthly sorry. So yeah, bi-weekly, yeah, bi-weekly. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> bye. 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 bye.